the living entities. Time, material nature, and karma. Five topics. And by understanding those five topics, you've understood the whole of Bhagavad Gita. So we're going to speak about one of those topics. The one that's least described in Bhagavad Gita. The one that's described most in Bhagavad Gita. There are more verses in Bhagavad Gita about the modes of material nature than any other topic. That means it's important, right? Krishna explains it a lot. Modes of nature, or property. And then, of course, Ishwara, God. And the living entity, the jivas, and karma. Then there's this one other very important topic, time, that not so much is presented about time. I mean, what do you know about time from Bhagavad Gita? One verse, Krishna says, time I am, kavos me, the destroyer of all things. And that's it. At least as far as the disclosure of Bhagavad Gita. So something that some persons here will be with us in Gita Nagri, some persons won't be coming to Gita Nagri, but the theme of our topic during the Gita Nagri retreat this coming memorial weekend is time, using time in Krishna's service, properly using time in Krishna's service. But all the speakers are going to speak on that theme. And what I wanted to do here is a little prelude, something that I'm going to speak, not the whole thing, but part of what I'm going to present on what is time. The psychic people would say, what's the living entity? Or what's karma? Or what's Ishwara? What's the modes of nature? So this is the fifth one, what is time? So to, to do that, I'd like to read Third canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, you can look up the verse later if you like. Chapter 5, text number 10. If you have one of those little doodads, you can find the verse on your doodad. Um, this is Vidura speaking with Maitreya. Now, who is Vidura? Vidura is the uncle of the Pandavas. He's the brother of Pandu and Dhritarashtra. He's the third brother. But he's not just one of the royal dynasty and the Kuru dynasty, but the Bhagavatam, Canto 1, chapter 13, discloses that he is Yamaraj, one of the great Mahajans who doesn't have a very nice job. You know, some of you might have a job you're not so pleased with, but you have to do it because it maintains your family, one of those things. He has a job where he has, is he busy morning to night, giving the reactions to the sinful deeds of those who are very sinful from the human form of life. If one is very sinful, you go before Yamaraj, and he has and an amazing capacity to know exactly all the wrong things that you've done. How embarrassing. And then he has the awards, a suitable punishments like a judge. The judgment day when it's brought before Yamaraj. So nobody ever says thank you to Yamaraj. It's a very thankless task. It's not what he really wants to do is to be with Krishna but he's serving Krishna remotely in this not very pleasant position. So to fulfill Yamaraj's desire, an arrangement was made by Krishna that he would be cursed by Manduka Muni. Did you know that? The Manduka Muni, you know the story? Um, the Vedas described, there were some thieves that were very accomplished and they were stealing and stealing and finally people got fed up and they formed a, a 
group that went chasing after the thieves. And they went running and running and they were chasing and chasing and they went up a mountain. They followed them up the mountain and they found a cottage. In the mountain they went in the cottage. So the police force surrounded the cottage. And then they arrested everybody inside, including the sage that was inside the cottage. They thought he was a thief too. And one, that was Manda Kamuni. So they were all brought before a judge, and the judge pronounced the death penalty. So just as they were about to be put to death, someone recognized, wait a minute, that's not one of the thieves, that's Manda Kamuni. So he notified the king, and the king immediately came and begged pardon of Manda Kamuni, please release him. So he was released. And Manda Kamuni wasn't upset with the king, he was upset with Yamaraj. So he, had, he was so powerful, he went before Yamaraj and demanded an explanation. Why have you arranged this, that I would be killed for something I didn't do? And Yamaraj said, well, when you were a small boy, you had this practice of taking straws, sharpened, dried grass that became straw, and you were piercing insects with the straw. So for that activity, you're, you were to die by being thrown on the chunga, chunga swords upraised, and the platform moves and somebody falls under the swords, they're dead. So, Mandu Kamuni said, when one is very small, like a small child, some behavior like that isn't equally punishable for someone who's an adult who does something like that. But you don't know the principles of Dharma properly, I curse you, you should take birth on earth and leave this post. So, Yamaraj was cursed, and he took birth as Vidura. So Vidura was actually a very elevated personality, Yamaraj. He certainly knew the codes of Dharma, without all the Mahabharata details. He knew the codes of Dharma, as Yamaraj knows the codes of Dharma. Better even than Bhishma Dev and Dronacharya, at least in, in the drama of this, this roving of Draupadi. It's only Vidura who stood up and said, stop this. This is a great violation of Dharma. And the Royal Assembly is just standing here watching and letting this happen, remaining silent. We'll be destroyed by this violation of Dharma. Women are always to be protected. And this is the opposite We'll all be destroyed. You wait and see. So, Vidura knew Dharma very well. But he's a very elevated person, but when he left the royal palace, being insulted by Duryodhana, he went on pilgrimage. Described in the first canto, chapter 13, he went on pilgrimage. And one of the places that he visited was where he heard extensively from Maitreya. And Maitreya himself was a great personality. Maitreya Muni, great learned person, mystic yogi. <clears throat> but more, even, more important even is Maitreya had heard the whole of Uddhava Gita directly. Didn't hear a recording of it. Mm -hmm. He was there and heard directly as Krishna spoke Uddhava Gita to Uddhava. So he had become a, a, a perfected being through that hearing. And Krishna, before departing at the, at the end of his pastimes, he requested Maitreya to do the following service. He said, very soon, <coughs> Vidura is going to come here in the deep darkness of the forest of Vrindavan, and I would like you to instruct him, as you have heard from me. Vidura is very dear to me. 
So sure enough, a few days later, Vidura came. Krishna does things before they happen because he's omniscient. And Vidura came. Vidura was guided by Uddhava to go find Maitreya and Vidura begins asking questions. Whole uh, chapter filled with questions. And I'm going to read um, a little bit. Shukadeva Goswami said, Vidura, the best amongst the Kuru dynasty, who was perfect in devotional service to the Lord, thus reached the source of the celestial Ganges, Haridwar, where Maitreya, the great fathomless learned sage of the world, was seated. Vidura, who was perfect in gentleness and satisfied in transcendence, inquired from him. And he asks a number of questions. But I'm just going to read one part. O great sage, kindly narrate how the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the independent, desireless Lord of the three worlds and the controller of all energies, accepts incarnations and creates the cosmic manifestation with perfectly arranged regular principles for its maintenance. Then he asks about time. What's the verse? It's chapter 10, 10 verse. Chapter 10. Vidura inquired for my prayer, O oh my Lord, O oh greatly learned sage, kindly describe eternal time, which is another form of the Supreme Lord, the wonderful actor, right? Time I am. Another form of the Supreme Lord, the wonderful actor. What are the symptoms of eternal time? Please describe them to us in detail. Maitreya said, <clears throat> eternal time is the primeval source of the interactions of the three modes of material nature. It is unchangeable and limitless, and it works as the instrument of the Supreme Personality Godhead for his pastimes in the material creation. So this verse is purport is packed. I'll read it slowly. It's like each sentence is volumes can be spoken about, but here's Prabhupada's purport summarizing what is time. So we've already heard two things. Time is a, is a form identical with the Supreme Lord that we heard in his question. Now we're in this, the verse is that time is um, unchangeable, limitless, the source of the three modes of material nature and it's an instrument of the personality of God. So its instrument is the Shakti, Kala Shakti. So the energy and the energetic are inseparable. In that sense, the energy is not different than this, the energetic. Time, I am. 
purport. The impersonal time factor is the background of the material manifestation as the instrument of the Supreme Lord. It is the ingredient of assistance offered to material nature. No one knows where time began and where it ends, and it is time only which can keep a record of all the creation, <coughs> maintenance, and destruction of the material manifestation. This time factor is the material cause of creation and is therefore a self-expansion of the personality of Godhead. Time is considered the impersonal feature of the Lord. Just this morning, um, we read another verse in chapter 21 of this third canto, where um, this is Karna Muni, very early in the creation. He's seeing Lord Vishnu before him, like Dhruvadit. Dhruvadit meditation, um, fixed in trance on the Supreme Lord, then the Lord appeared before him. We know that past that. So, Dhruva offered prayers. Here also, Maitreya is offering prayers. And one of his prayers, the one we read this morning, is he's appreciating or glorifying Vishnu that you have this wheel which is time. And it, time has three, um, the word in Sanskrit is nabhi. Nabhi means navel. Or three phases of time, past, present, and future. And it has 360 spokes, and it has six rims, and something, so many things. There's um, seasons, there's so many months per year. It uses the number 13 because we do calculation by solar. In Vedic astronomy, it's calculation by lunar. So there's 13 months in the lunar calendar, the 13th appearing every three years, right? Purushottama, every three years. So it's 12. And then every three years is the 13th. Time works like that. With six rims. No good. No good. Mataji? No good. Then it says, as it's just read, this, these three, three phases of time are moving around the hub or rotating around Brahman, timeless Brahman. So what, what's in the spiritual world? Prabhupada's way of saying this is time is conspicuous by its absence. It's a nice phrase. Time is conspicuous by its absence. Time as we know it, the past, present, and future kind of time is conspicuous by its absence. What kind of time is there in the spiritual world? Eternal time. Time that knows no beginning. That knows no end. It's beginningless. It's endless. It's eternal. That's time in the spiritual realm. I'll or go, go back and read the, the other part of the report, but I want to just do a few things. This past, present, and future, the three phases of time. They're described uh, very briefly in Sri Brahma Samhita. So I'm going to cover three things. Not, not just past, present, and future, but... Um, this is a, an illustration of Mahavishnu. And Mahavishnu is lying in the causal ocean, the Karana ocean. 
Karana Sindhu. And he's Karana Dakshayi Vishnu or Mahavishnu. And time, in the Vedic picture of time, time is cyclical. Just keep cycling again and again. Now, if you had to be the creator, that's a very practical way to do it. You don't have to do it differently each time. Cycles. Just like the seasons. Or anything you can think of that has phases of time, phases of the moon. You know, the, the, the movements of the sun. The seasons. Think of anything that has to do with time. And it's cyclical. That's a Vedic picture of time. So, the picture that we're seeing is <coughs> where during the time of cosmic annihilation, the living entities are within the body of Mahavishnu in a dormant state. They're still conscious, but they're in the lowest stage of consciousness, according to the Vedic depiction. Conscious, sleep, deep sleep. Deep sleep is in Sanskrit is susupti, or it's like anesthesia. Someone that's put under anesthesia, they, that's what they're under, the susupti. And then they come out of the susupti state and they're dreaming and then they become awake. Three stages of consciousness. So the living entities, all the living entities are withdrawn within the body of Mahavishnu in this susupti state. And, and the, the duration of time of the cosmic manifestation is equal to the duration of time of the cosmic dissolution. It's cyclical. So from that, and you can't say when it began. Since time immemorial, the cycle is going on. So the living entities are in this dormant state, and the personality of Godhead, Mahavishnu, two things. He wishes that those living entities come again to him in a loving mood, an eternal loving service mood. That's his wish. In Sanskrit, this is Icha. He has a desire. And when God has a desire, it happens. That's all he has to do. He doesn't have to lift the pinky. He just desires. And then his internal potency, in this case her name is Brahma Devi. Brahma Devi understands the desire of her master, as a wife has an understanding of the desire of husband. She's perfectly understanding because she's, a, she's his internal potency, his desire. And she assists him in his desire. And that's what's depicted here. Well, he glances at the shadow energy known by different names. Here is the depiction of Durga, but other names are Chaya Devi. Chaya means shadow. So there's an object, and there's the shadow of the object. The shadow is nothing other than coming from the object itself. But there isn't substance there, it's just shadow. So the shadow energy, or another term that's used in the Vedas is Pradhan. Pradhan. Pradhan means, it's like a cloud in the sky. Like, you know, there's sky. And up in the sky there may be a cloud. So the cloud, is also within the sky. So like, you know, you get an airplane going down the runway, zoom, zoom, zoom. You're lifting off the ground. And then you're below the clouds. Then you go through the clouds. Then you're above the clouds. So while you're in the clouds, look out to the left side, to the right side, what do you see? You see clouds. But you're actually in the sky. Yeah? Below the cloud, above the cloud, and within the cloud, you're within the sky. Yes? So, this Pradhan is like a cloud that's in the vastness of the spiritual sky. And Mahavishnu glances 
at that cloud, or Pradhan, or Chaya Devi. He has glances. And his glances described in Brahma Samhita like this. They're pencil rays. Something like you might imagine at night, there's someone has a flashlight, maybe you call it a torch. So here's a laser pointer. So it, you know, it, it makes a, there's a light on the wall coming from this little device. But if you have a flashlight, then you see rays and then a beam of light on the wall, right? So like that, the, the glance of Mahavishnu is going towards this undifferentiated state of the totality of material energy called Pradhan. And according to Sri Brahma Samhita, there are two ingredients that are within that glance. And there, the two ingredients are arranged by the internal potency, Brahma Devi. Two, two ingredients. Here they are. One is the time energy, and the other is the living entities, the jivas. The glance of Mahavishnu has two elements, time energy and the living entities. Because the purpose is to give the living entities that were within his body a chance to again return to him in a loving mood. So this is for making that provision. And this is the sequence of events to make that provision. His glance, he doesn't do anything. It specifically says in Brahma Samhita, there's no direct contact with matter by God. It's indirect, he just his glance. So then there's a breakdown of the glance. Brahma arranges for the living entities and a transformation of herself because she has unlimited components to her potency and the material portion of her potency in the form of time energy and the living entities are then entrusted to the glance. And the glance has a name. And the name is Shambhu. One of the names of Lord Shiva is Shambhu. And that glance, I'm just describing now, the purpose of all this is time. What is, what's time? So, the time energy and the living entities are carried by Shambhu, or the glance of Mahavishnu, to contact the material elements, excuse me, the, the, this pradhan, this shadow energy, or the cloud of material energy. And when this dormant, inactive, undifferentiated totality of material energy, this God's energy, is activated or energized by the living entities and the time energy, then things start to happen over there. Like, um, the elements start to differentiate out from the undifferentiated big warehouse. They all jumbled up. The first element that comes out is our dear friend, false ego. So even before we do anything, there's false ego. And then we start doing things according to the modes of nature, and then the modes of nature mixing with false ego produce other elements. The modes of goodness mixing with false ego produces the mind. The mode of passion mixing with false ego produces the material intelligence. You gotta have material intelligence to get things done. So, passion. And the mode of ignorance mixing with false ego creates a whole bunch of stuff. Ignorance is very active. The five gross elements, five knowledge acquiring senses, five working senses, five objects to senses, a whole bunch of stuff. that are all necessary for creation. But they become, before they <clears throat> differentiate out, there's this time energy. Because otherwise it's just dormant, just dormant, undifferentiated stuff. Pradhan. 
then there's a little more detail. This time energy has components. And the time energy identified by a Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, it has two parts. The force of activity, Kriya Shakti, and the force of instrumentality, or the Lord's desire, Icha. The way that Bhakti Siddhanta describes it is because Rama understands his desire, it's by her desire and the instrumental will of the Supreme Lord. She, she, she hands this over to Shambhu, who carries it to Pradhan. But this is what time, so this is the time energy. A very, very simple way to think of it is like electricity. So, so there's, there's, a, uh, there's a fan going around. Withdraw the electricity, it stops. But send the electricity, then this device will start to spin. So the powerhouse is the Supreme Lord. Rama is like the electricity. The glance is like the copper wire or the conductor. And then there's the device that gets activated by the electricity. That's material nature. Material nature doesn't do things on its own. It's activated by a spiritual force. Matter doesn't create on its own. It moves by the force of spiritual touch. The spiritual touch is twofold. The living entities, they're spiritual. The living entities can't do things without the spiritual touch of God. The spiritual touch of God is his time energy. Say it this way, nothing happens without time. Like here we are, we're in the temple room. And before we were in the temple room, we were somewhere else. And after some time, we're going to go somewhere, do something else. Without time, we wouldn't be in the temple room. I mean, it's kind of, we just take it for granted. But we wouldn't be able to be here. We wouldn't be able to do anything without time energy. So, so time energy, what is time? Time is an energy of the Supreme Lord that's generated by, or transformed by, the inter internal potency of Mahavishnu to bring about creation so we can do stuff. Now there's two others that what time is. And now, then, you know, what are we going to do with all this interesting, very technical talk? We'll get there too. So after this glance of Mahavishnu and the elements start to differentiate out. That's got another name. Maybe you've heard that other name. It's called Mahatattva. What's the Mahatattva? It's the 24 elements. It's like it's the big warehouse that's now not jumbled up anymore. It's all the elements necessary for creation. They're just sitting there, dormant, but differentiated out. There's water, there's earth, there's fire, there's ether. Prabhupada gives the example like automobile parts on a symbol. Just lying near the automobile factory. In order to assemble them, what do you need? You need intelligence. You need a, a person to put them together. So, sequentially, I'm going to. Another factor of time is as follows. The personality of God, that same Mahavishnu, has transcendental pores like we have, you know, for, where the perspiration comes out. He has pores where seeds of universes come out. You've heard the phrase, as above, so below. Whatever exists in the spiritual world, its counterpart is here in the material world. Heard that one before? As above, so below. Things that we do have some relation to something that he does, not the other way around. So, from his transcendental body, there are spiritual 
I'm describing now what's in Sri Brahma Samhita. There are spiritual seeds of universes. Something like in the, in the seed of a, of a banyan tree, there's, there's actually hundreds of seeds in each of the pods of a banyan tree. Hundreds of them. There's hundreds of banyan trees in each of those little pods. But they're just in a seed state. So these little seeds of universes come streaming out of his body as he exhales. Try it. No universes are coming out. But when he exhales, universes come streaming out and they enter into this Mahatattva, now differentiated big warehouse. And they begin to conglomerate or somehow congeal, like, you know, form around those little seeds. And then the personality of Godhead, Mahavishnu, expands as personalities that are the controllers of those elements. And it's a little different kind of a concept, but they're not, there's no universe yet, because it's just like seeds congealing with stuff around. There's demigods that are prototype demigods, because there's no, demigods come from Lord Brahma. Then, you know, he sets up the universe and they help him administrate the universe. Administrative demigods look after the affairs of the universe. There's no universe yet. So these are, according to Brahma Samhita and Srimad Bhagavatam, they're prototype demigods. You know, primordial. You know what the word prototype means. Okay, so they're prototype demigods. And they have their thing that they do with each of the elements, but they're not able to coordinate with the other elements to produce the universe. So they offer prayers to the Supreme Lord. Help! We're not able to cooperate with one another. We need your input to help us. And so, to um, fulfill their request, Mahavishnu enters into each of the elements, or each atom of the element, as the super soul, not only of his individual soul, but in, of each atom. And along with him comes one of his energies. Guess which one? Kala. And Kala is an energy of God, the Lord of the heart and the Lord of within every atom, that does the congealing. He, 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 he gives them the capacity to work in a cooperative manner. Like we know in Bhagavad Gita, Maya Dyakshena Prakriti, Suyate Sutarashra. Krishna oversees Adyaksha. He oversees Prakriti. He does so through the agency of his time energy. And his time energy then, you know, gets them to work cooperatively. And then karma starts to unfold. Because karma has been suspended. Didn't go away, just went to sleep. And, the, and now the last part, the reason it went to sleep is at the time of annihilation, the same time energy, this is now 11th Canto of Bhagavatam, withdraws all the elements of creation back to their Pradhan state, like the unfolding and then the collapsing of the universe. Unfolding by the force of time energy, with, he withdraws his time energy, and the, as the time energy is withdrawn, everything comes back into its unmanifest state. Pretty cool. He doesn't do anything. He just glances. And even as described, once that congealing takes place, the universes are floating on the causal ocean for 1,000 celestial years. That's the causal ocean. They're just floating on the causal ocean. Here's the next picture. Or this one. 
like Prabhupada uses the example like footballs, just floating on the ocean. Unlimited numbers of footballs, only they're universal, they're big footballs. And they're not even filled yet, because he, Mahavishnu, is enjoying with Ramadev.